Now, let's go on to her prosecutor, prosecutorial record. Uh, let's go on to Kamala Harris's prosecutorial record. Uh, she uh, was, in 2003, she unseated an incumbent DA, Ter- Ternice Hallian, in an upset by building a broad coalition of supporters ranging from low-income minority voters to Bay Area elites. She was in tune and well-networked with both of those. So she she was going to cocktail parties with the elites in the Silicon Valley area to win this Alameda County prosecutorial uh, seat. And she, she knew everybody, knew everything about them. It, it reminded me about reading about Barack Obama in like Chicago politics early on going to things. And he knew every, every person in the room, why they were important. He was well prepped uh, and, you know, knew who to schmooze. And, but she also maintained a lot of connections in low income areas uh, and minority communities and was able to speak to both. And that is on the Democratic side, specifically a skill that helps a politician rise quickly. You know, are they able to speak the language of the because make no mistake about it, the Democrats for whatever, you know, Republicans or corporatists and big money politicians like the reality is if you I watched a great show on Apple TV about it's called Morning Show and it's about the Me Too movement. Highly recommend it. Great show. But, you know, it's it's the New York City cocktail parties on the Upper West Side and the the fabulous. They're all talking Democratic politics. You know, you have to court those voters as well as going to uh, lower income areas and courting to those voters and people who have the ability to do both tend to rise fairly quickly as she did. Mm-hmm. And that was a knock against Pete Buttigieg too, was that he, he was courting the high, high end part of the party, but he was failing to connect with the, uh, the regular guys, the regular right. man. So, uh, this is really when she began to be tagged with the ambition, uh, because the, the way that she ran the race es- essentially was, you know, she didn't do a lot different as the the prosecutor, but the way that she jabbed elbows in that race, you know, it was very similar to the way that she did it through the presidential campaign. Um, I, I want to talk about ambition because this is a. It seems to me that female ambition gets knocked, but Trump is super ambitious. Joe Biden has been ambitious his whole career. Pete Buttigieg is ambitious, like. Where does Pete Buttigieg get off being a failing mayor of South Bend of Indiana? We live in Indiana. We know it's 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 rough up there. Uh, and he's going to run from the mayor of the third, fourth largest town in Indiana to be president like that's He's super ambitious. Like everybody in Indiana has known this guy has significant ambitions. And uh, but it only seems to be a tag on females in politics but the founders really cared. They knew that people were ambitious. Like it's the whole basic premise of economics. Scarcity is at the the foundation of economics. You never feel that you have enough. People never feel that they have enough. They see, you know, you have a Ford F-150 while your neighbor has a Maserati. You always look at what you don't have. And in politics, people always have an ambition to rise in the ranks and gain power. And the American system, that ambition was pitted pitted against each other. The two-party system pits. That's why I'm critical of Republicans on things like the post office or Trump's executive order trying to take spending power when only the House has the ability to do that. It's the Republicans that are to keep that ambition to grow power in check because we know the Democrats are going to oppose whatever Donald Trump does. That Everybody knows that. It's not relevant. Like it's Their criticism doesn't matter. It's the criticism from Republicans to a Republican president that matters. Uh, And so ambition is just a part of politics. It will always be a part of whatever system of human organization exists. If you have a Rotary Club in your small town, there's always somebody who wants to be the leader and there's ambition there. And so the, the American system was really built with that in mind. So I don't I don't fault people for having ambition. I have ambition. I have big goals and big dreams for we are libertarians and what I want it to be. Um, That's just part of 
life, right? Everybody has an ambition to finish college or right. finish whatever. What makes I think the biggest grotesque, what makes it grotesque is that she wants to control other people and be in charge of controlling others. Right. I, I think the other the other thing too is that people understand that everybody has ambition, and that's actually a good quality that people find. Um, you know, the, a lot of times when when marriages break apart, it's you know because the one person says the other person wasn't trying to do better or trying to improve themselves or trying to um, uh, didn't have any ambition. Right. The problem comes in when you're willing to uh, violate certain ethical mores and and your own your own thought processes and what you believe in in order to attain that ambition right to to get that power to get that control to get the the next rung of the ladder if you're willing to step on the people to get there if you're willing to um, bend the rules or break them completely those that's when it becomes a negative attack on someone yeah for sure um so uh while kamala harris touted that she was tough on crime she was often criticized by local law enforcement for and this plays into the ambition role for only pursuing cases that she knew she could win to pad her record uh she didn't want to have a loss on her record that could be used against her in future runs and the the local law enforcement she came in being supported by the police but by the end of her run as prosecutor she was not well liked by the police afterwards because when she would be uh, called out for not taking on tough cases, she would blame sloppy police work. So she ended up for, you know, for being a cop, she ended up not being well liked by a fellow cop. So <laughs> um, now her felony conviction rate was far lower than her counterparts, but higher than her predecessor in specific areas like murder rates. Um, now, as libertarians, we're not necessarily apt to uh, s to look at that as a positive. Oh, you're really effective at, at uh, prosecuting felonies. Mm, most of those were victimless crimes, so we're, we're not down with that. Um, her conviction rate, she increased the conviction rate, like I said, from her predecessor from 52% to 67%, uh, and that was the highest in a decade, and it was an 85% conviction rate among homicides, Drug crime convictions went from 56% to 74%. And this is especially where the libertarian critique starts to come in. You know, she, what was the fact about 1,500 marijuana users? She, she aggressively she, pursued anybody that had marijuana in her yeah. jurisdiction. Yeah, she, uh, she really ramped up the, the prosecution on marijuana convictions. And then when, asked about whether she had ever smoked marijuana she laughed right she was prosecuting and putting people in jail and said that uh you know she was a huge drug warrior as a prosecutor because it was popular at that time much like joe biden when it was popular she was for it and then when it was unpopular she was against it and now oh mea culpa my bad and of course everybody just the, what i love about the the progressive left is that the bernie bros are growing a movement that might hold some of these politicians these authoritarian democratic po politicians to, to account mm -hmm. and saying no it's not popular that you put these people in jail you should you should actually apologize and have real contrition for what you've what you've accomplished as we saw with joe biden's record the man put millions of people in jail based on the the various things that he championed and kamala harris played into that um, well, and her her thing too is that she's trying to get uh high conviction rates right right so murder and rape and things like that are harder to convict on than drug crimes so you go after the drug crimes and where are the drug crimes located at based off the statistics because the drug war was started and it's a specific reason yeah. those statistics show that, that there's a certain community that has more drug crime in it so you go and you extra police that community which inflates the statistics to kind of keep that perpetual motion going uh, and then it just becomes easy to pull people in and and get a conviction rate so you can get your conviction rate really high on those types of crimes so that you don't have to focus so much on the other crimes that are really the ones that you should be focusing on. They're the real victim crimes, but they're just harder to convict on.
Yeah, uh, I, I view, for instance, the the grassroots Black Lives Matter overall message of criminal justice reform. I view that as uh, you know an ally to what libertarians have been championing for so long. You know, ending mandatory minimums, reducing uh, victimless crimes, reducing felonies for things where people, you know, these these are core libertarian principles. You know, when, uh, uh, which always blows my mind that libertarians argue against the concept of systemic racism. Um, yeah, what's the? Um, do you remember the number of the episode we did with uh, John Odermatt where we talked a lot about that? Yeah, I mean that Certain is a lot. things we want to change, right? So yeah, that's the message that we that that libertarians have been saying for decades that stop with the victimless crimes. Let's let's focus on on the police power in if you're going to have that. You know, we, there's 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 calls for, you know, privatizing police and things like that. But you really want your police department to be focused on the things that are really hurting other people, the crimes that are really hurting other people and not, you know, yeah, process victim- crimes, jaywalking, things like that. It's a silly jaywalking, prostitution, <laughs> uh, l- licensing enforcement, you know, the, the Very big, yeah. going around, he, he, Harry was so right. So Harry sparked my brain on something. He, he said, you know, all the smoking bans that went into place 10 years ago that libertarians argued against by saying this will build a mechanism that will bring enforcement in other areas. I checked around to some friends and the and Marion County health department here in Indianapolis is going in and fining local businesses a thousand dollars. If a single patron isn't wearing a mask, thereby turning business owners into cops and you're, you're finding businesses like restaurants and bars that are barely making at a thousand dollars or $5,000 for five instances on businesses that are struggling right now. It's incomprehensible. It's, and that is, a lot of those businesses are supporting people in the lower income brackets of various races, you know? And so when we get tough on crime or we get tough on drugs as Biden and Harris have done, they're disproportionately affecting lower income workers while turning around and saying that's who they would support. It's complete and total hypocrisy. If you support black lives matter and you look at the record of the two of these people, I don't know how you reconcile that because you can't. You can't look at the fact that Joe Biden, when you look at Joe Biden's record, as we did in episode 450, when systemic racism is defined in 2020, it is all of the things that Joe Biden championed and Kamala Harris enacted as a prosecutor. She used all of Joe Biden's tools. Like, have they changed? I don't know. You know, I, I, I see Kamala Harris helping pass Sosta and Festa. You know, I see her uh, saying one thing and doing another on a consistent basis. I see Joe Biden saying fairly blatantly racist things and he gets a pass because he's a Democrat and he's up against Trump. Like, I, I, I don't know how you reconcile that as a Biden voter. Uh, if, you, if you care about the Black Lives Matter movement. I can't, which is why I'm not going to vote for them. I'm I'm going to vote for Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen, who actually walk the walk and talk the talk on this stuff. Um, so, yep. uh, so her conviction rates were largely because of plea deals of 73 first degree homicide convictions. She accepted manslaughter, third degree murder on 32 of them and second degree for nearly all others meaning she didn't do her job in prosecuting the actual crime, uh, but pleading down to a lesser crime. So she padded her statistics. And so what a lot of uh, the problem with plea deals a lot of times is that a person will be arrested and the prosecutor will tack on a ton of charges. They'll find the most draconian law that they can passed in 1904 and tack that on and get you to plea down and, and say, all right, well, you're facing 900 years unless you plea down to this and you'll only get 18 and it's a way to, for a prosecutor to pad their record. It's a way for them to get convictions when they don't really have a case on the actual criminal charge. You know, let's say Reinhold goes out and uh, commits a murder, but they don't have enough evidence. So they get them on tax evasion, you know, or something like that because it's a, it's a lesser charge. So, um, 
you know, in general, libertarians believe in prosecuting a person for the crime that they committed. Um, but, you know, if you talk to a prosecutor, they go this. We know this person committed the crime. We just don't have the evidence nailed, lo you know, locked tight. And we want to take a bad person off the street. So, you know, that's that's their defense. Um, you know, she got someone who committed multiple sexual assaults to plea to battery, for instance. Um, now, Hody, a researcher, says a prosecutor is supposed to convict the actual crime committed and plea deals are supposed to be reversed for mutual benefit. It is a system that is abused by most prosecutors, to be sure, but nobody abused it more than she did. I highly recommend the book Three Felonies a Day. To see how corrupt prosecutors like Harris use this tactic and abuse it to advance their careers and pad their stats. The journey ends in innocent, nonviolent people getting hurt. So also while she was prosecutor, uh, she opened a special unit that investigated bullying of people in what Hody calls the GSM community, which is the LGBT community. But I just uh, it's gender and sexual minorities, which has has been uh, uh, pushed because it, it there's there's a fight over LGBTQ, you know, and then you you see the alphabet soup. Uh, the one article I read is I was it's like GSM isn't that like the game sports network or whatever, and so I looked it up and uh, they were like there's just too many LGBTQs so let's just go with GSM. Um, now, Ho as Hody says, one might argue that expansion of hate crimes is a de detriment, but the budget requiring special hate crimes investigations was passed by Congress. She simply extended this protection to the community and crimes tar targeting these individuals are valid hate crimes if we are forced, as Harris was to assign special investigations to hate crimes. I don't really, I don't kn know that I agree with Hody on that assessment. I think um, hate crimes can often be subjective, and it just gives another tool of prosec prosecutorial stacking as it as it's called what what say you reinhold well um hate crimes are very i've, I've got i've got a long history with discussing um well you've committed so hate many crimes hey it's just because reinhold. i see i can see both sides huh hate crime hate crime expert reinhold expert yeah expert on it no it's, it's just uh so i have a problem with it where you can say how are you how can you um, prosecute somebody or sentence them based off what they were thinking, what, what was in their head, right? But then we give a lesser sentence because of the same reasons, right? So if you go to, if you kill somebody, but you were killing somebody because you were in a mental state that made it harder for you to uh, make rational decisions, right? You were angry, they had, they had hurt your wife or something, and, and you, so there's extenuating circumstances that then get applied to the sentencing of the crime that that gets taken into effect. Right. So what's the difference between that and a hate crime where you say, okay, what the person was thinking or whatever should change the, the sentencing of that person. Now, I don't believe that it should change. There, there should be an actual um, statute that's different than a regular crime. Like if you commit a crime, you commit a crime. If you commit murder, you commit, you, uh, commit theft, you commit something like that, you've committed that crime. But where the hate crime statute should come into play if they're going to be used is in determining what the sentencing of that crime should be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So as a libertarian, you know, I, I think that as long as we're focusing on crimes that are not victimless crimes, crimes that have harmed somebody else, and we're taking the state of the mind of the person into consideration on the sentencing side of things, then that's when you get into um, whether that's acceptable or not. I think there's a, there's a room on either side for that one. But uh, what I always hated was uh, somebody who was innocent because of insanity instead of guilty, though insane, right? So to say that somebody's innocent because they uh, weren't of, the, of a mind where they could make a rational decision, I, I don't like the way that's worded. I think it should be that you were found guilty of the crime, but because you were incapable of making the valid decision at that point, we're going to expunge it or give you a, a punishment that is related to getting your mental health back in shape. Right. Um, 
when it comes to hate crimes too, I just, I think that there is a place for it to be used as an additional sentencing tool. Okay. Um, 